Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and I really wonder whether 20 years ago when he first joined me here, my guest and I could possibly have dreamed that today we would be discussing not his always beautifully written decisions issued from the federal bench, but rather his equally compelling opinions about everything and anything under the sun issued from something akin to retirement in sunny California and available to all of us now at the on-off switch of a computer. For retired Federal Appeals Court Judge Lee Sarakin has his own bench in the blogosphere now, quite appropriately designated x-judge.blogspot.com, and I highly recommend it for judgments high and low. But as we begin this first of two 21st century Open Mind programs with Judge Sarakin, I want to ask him whether over the years he's at all changed his mind about some of the many decisions he's made and opinions he's offered, both on the blog and on the bench. Lee, what do you say? No. Uh, Never I, changed your mind. I, I've looked back. Uh, first of all, I've reread the blog in anticipation of today, and there isn't anything in there that I uh, would want to change today. And insofar as my opinions are concerned, uh, there too, I'm, I'm very comfortable with all of those opinions and stand by them today. Some well, of them have been reversed, but even despite that, uh, I still think even the reversals. Yes. Uh, I, I recognize the validity of some of the reversals, but I don't think if I were writing the decision again, I would do it any differently. Well, you know, I ask you this question because I was thinking as I prepared for our program together, I was thinking of the time I went out to your part of the world now, California, and I went up to San Francisco and was able to tape there a program with my old professor, uh, Kenneth M. Stamp, one of the best historians, American historians around. And I asked Ken Stamp, over the years, have you changed your mind in terms of historical judgments? And he very quickly said yes. And he had changed his mind about certain things about Abraham Lincoln and certainly changed his mind about Franklin D. Roosevelt, so that by then he and I agreed on a very pro attitude toward FDR. And I wondered what you would say if I asked you the same question. Well, those are historical uh persons and events, uh, so in perspective you might feel differently about it. But uh, when I render the decision or when I write these blogs, I give it some careful thought and um, I, I think I've been very consistent over the years in, in my views and I, I think they're reflected in the current uh, posts they call them to the blog. Well, I didn't even know that that was the appropriate word. I said to somebody that I was blogging and they say, no, you post to your blog. That's well, I've learned <laughs> something now. What about the blog? How do you like doing, I love posting it. the blog? Uh, it, uh, it's my only art form. Uh, uh, art form? Yes. R writing is the only thing that I think I do well. I can paint. I can sing. I'm somewhat of a musician. But the writing is my art form, and I thoroughly enjoy it. And I look for something that I can write about. I wish more people were reading it because I think very few people read my blog. I understand that there are millions of blogs out there. I don't know how to get everybody's attention. Maybe this program will do it. What do you think about the blog itself? There have been those who have said that the blog marks the death 
of journalism. Well, I know there's a dispute about it. One of the things that bothers me the most, and I'm in no position to make recommendations as to changes, but I think one of the worst things about the blog world is how many authors are anonymous or use some fictitious name. I think it would be 100 percent better if everybody was required to use their own name. Uh, I read some of the commentaries. Even sometimes I'll go to a musician and there'll be a piece that the musician has done. And then some of the exchanges between the critics are so vile at each other, the language that's used, the personal attacks. And I just think that if they identified themselves, uh, that a lot of that would go away. Do you think this personal attack is perhaps the purpose of blogging? Well, because you're anonymous, I guess you can say anything, and I think that that's one of the failings of it. On the other hand, from an informational point of view, it's limitless. Uh, you can find anything on the Internet. and uh, Truth and untruth. A absolutely. Doesn't that concern you? Oh, very much so. And it's hard to weed out what is the truth from what is untrue. Um, but I'd rather have it than not have it. Why? Uh, because it has this wealth of information that is so readily available. There isn't anything. If you have an illness or you want to look up something, I want to look at a Supreme Court opinion, I can get it in, in an instant. And I, I think that the availability of that information is far... Uh, exceeds any of the detriment of the internet. Well, now the individual blogs, I've been looking through a number of yours, and uh, I find in them, of course, so much grist for our mill here. For instance, one I came across, and you know that this is a subject that um, I've been very much interested in for a long, long time. This is your February 17th, 2007 uh, blog Caught TV or not to be? Yes. Uh, what is your fix? I'm, I'm um, mixed. I, I have to admit that I'm very ambivalent on this issue. I think there are a great many advantages. Lee Sarakin is ambivalent? Yes. <laughs> um, first of all, I don't see any reason why Supreme Court arguments should not be available um, both uh, video and, and audio. I know that some of the Supreme Court justices oppose it. They don't want to be recognized. They don't want excerpts to appear, uh, blips on the evening news. But uh, I, I think the public, and those who want to, because there can't be a great market for Supreme Court arguments except in some very rare cases, but I see no reason. All the arguments against TV in the courtroom, I think, do not apply to the appellate courts. Uh, insofar as the trial courts are concerned, I think there are some terrific advantages to having TV in the courtroom. It gives Name the public, one. Well, it gives the public the opportunity to see the system uh, at work. It wait, gives wait, the, wait, 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 Judge. Wait a minute. You say it gives the public the opportunity to see the system at work. Yes. Then you're talking about those instances in which what goes on in the courtroom is put on television. Yes. But that isn't what uh, cameras in the courts generally means. Cameras in the court means generally what the broadcaster wants to put yes. on of what goes on well, in that's the Well, that, that's the detriment of it. In other words, it's the selection that's the problem, not the fact that it's being televised, but what appears on, uh, on television uh, as a result of the choices that are being made. But you asked for a specific reason why I think there's some advantages to it as well as disadvantages. For the whole thing being changed. One of the advantages, I think, is... If there is a judge who was particularly um, arrogant, uh, impatient, uh, rude, I think having that judge televised on a couple of occasions and having that appear might change uh, that uh, judge's attitude and demeanor and temperament. Uh, I think that's an advantage. I think I mentioned in my article, um, I forget what case it was, uh, in the blog? Yes, it was the... Here we go. The woman who... Um, there was a Florida trial about... Um, oh, Anna Nicole Smith. Right. And uh, that was being televised. 
And I thought that was terrible. I think I mentioned in the blog that it looked like it was in somebody's basement uh, having a poker game. And people were standing up. You didn't know who the witnesses were. You didn't know who the lawyers was. The, the judge was obviously playing to the camera. And I thought that was a travesty. In fact, I think I end my blog by saying I've... I've been uh, somewhat in favor of uh, televising courtroom proceedings, but after seeing that, I thought they ought to pull the plug. Well, that's why I asked the question, yes. because you say you're ambivalent. Yes. But you've got to come down somewhere. You have too much of a responsibility as a man who served, as you have, in the courts for so long. Yes or no? Well, no, that's tough. yes, definitely uh, in the appellate courts, uh, okay. maybe in the trial courts. <laughs> I thought you were going to say no in the trial courts uh, on the basis um, of your blog. Well, I said I'm ambivalent about it because I do think there are some benefits. I th one of the things I mentioned in there um, was I thought if the O.J. Simpson case had been televised and he had been convicted that the African-American community would have realized that he had gotten a fair trial uh, and they would have seen the actual evidence and there wouldn't have been any backlash uh, uh, based upon his race. As it turned out, he got acquitted so that uh, uh, it certainly would not have served that purpose. But uh, I, I, I recognize uh, those who are opposed to it and the reasons for it. Generally, I'd say I'd, I'd be more in favor of it than against it. More in favor of it than against it. I'm, but I'm not. Right now, I'm not convinced either way. Uh, what's happening to cameras in the courts? One used to hear a great deal about it. Did the O.J. Simpson trial put a uh, a lid on it? I think they've tried it. There have been some experiments. One thing that they have learned is that the fear that it would affect the juries, witnesses, and judges has turned out to be incorrect. That they say once the, the uh, cameras in the courtroom, particularly if it's one of these voice-activated cameras, uh, that it hasn't had much effect at all upon the, the participants. So that's one of the arguments that have been made against it that I think has been proven to be inaccurate. But the argument that jurors, um, knowing that they would have to go home at the end of a trial and face the ire as well as the possible applause of their neighbors, might be reluctant. Well, except uh, a, a lot of them... Um, uh, a lot of the trials in which uh, TV cameras are used do not, one of the rules is that they do not show the jury. So the jurors do not appear on, on television or in the video. Now, how do you contrast the downside as well as the upside of cameras in the courts with the scribblers in the courts? Well, that's the thing. I mean, when I hear the Supreme Court say that they don't want uh, some quip, uh, some blip, on the, the TV news, I don't know why the risk is any greater if it's televised than if they have uh, uh, print media in, in the courtroom writing it down and having it appear uh, that night on the television. Now, you've been very modest about what you said about your audience for your blog. Did you get response to the question when you, uh, shall I say, editorialized or issued your opinion or your judgment or your decision about cameras in the courts? No, no, very, uh, I, 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 know, I have no recollection of anybody even responding to it. As I said, I, the readership is very limited, so that's a dangerous question to ask me because in most cases, I haven't heard from anybody. Lee, I'm going to write you from now All on right, when I please. read something uh, on the blog. But, but going uh, through a number of these, um, uh, the question of haters' speech, uh, as you call it, you're um, you're concerned about uh, blogging bringing out negative feelings. You've not experienced that. Well, I have, and I um, I, I think I mentioned in one of my earliest blogs that, and it goes back to what I said at the outset about people uh, write in an anonymous fashion. Uh, I was astonished when I first issued my my blog, and that was what was written in response to it, but what was written elsewhere, uh, elsewhere. on the internet. 
if I ran my name, for instance, to see what the reaction to the blog was, there, there were some uh, incredibly vicious personal attacks that just uh, uh, astonished me. I, I couldn't, and, and I responded to it, saying, you know, what, what if, I'm not an axe murderer. I may have written some opinions with which you don't agree. But where does all this venom come from? There was one person in particular, the very first uh, blog that I had uh, written, uh, said you should go and look at something called, about the Reuben Carter case, how Sarakin got it wrong. And, and I went to that, figuring, well, I'm going to find out the mistake I made. And he supposedly listed what was in my opinion. Ninety percent of it was not in my opinion, and then put it side by side of the prosecutor's uh, brief and said that if you compared my opinion to the prosecutor's brief, you could see that I was wrong. And I responded by saying, well, what, what about the 140,000 pages of uh, record? What about the unanimous uh, affirmance by the, United, uh, by the United States Court of Appeals? What about the refusal of the Supreme Court to review it? I mean, don't those things make any difference? And I said, if you took one side of a case and compared it to an opinion, the, the losing side would always make the judge look wrong. You know, I mean, it was, uh, so I thought that that was just so typical and such an unfair way to, uh, to present something. And then I realized that's, there's an awful lot of that on the Internet. So that diminished your good feelings about... Yes, I almost was ready to quit before I started. I said, gee, if this is the way it is, if this is the way people are going to talk about you, I thought I would write on some interesting subjects, hopefully get some feedback, whether I was right or wrong, to engage in an intellectual conversation with the world, uh, not to be faced with this very you know, vicious kind of re response. And there was a lot of it. What does that tell us about us? Well, I think, as you said before, I think the Internet does provide, because everything uh, is anonymous, with people to vent with no uh, repercussions from it. They know that th they can't be identified. They can say pretty much anything. And all you can do is respond to it, if you want to even, because some of it you know, reaches the point where you don't even want to answer it. But um, that's the downside of the Internet, I think. That's quite a downside. Yes. Uh, it means, doesn't it, um, diseducation rather than education? It, ma it means that we're I think I still think there's more good. There's more benefit to the internet than than detriment. So I wouldn't I wouldn't want to put an end to it. Meaning, you want to keep writing the blog. I want to keep writing the blog, and I, as I said, it as a source of information. And there's a lot of reliable information on the internet. I'd, I'd hate to see it gone. So you keep writing on the blog, but you quit being a federal judge. Yes. Now, how are we going to make those reconcile? Well, uh, well one thing about the blog, you can be criticized, but you can't be reversed. Uh, <laughs> now, you don't really mean No, that. no, I'm not. I, I never worried about reversals when I was on the court. Never even entered my mind. I know that sounds ridiculous, but you, you write the decision as you think it should be, and if you're reversed, you're reversed. And I think my record on reversals is pretty good. Uh, well, what about the reasons you offered at the time of your resignation? How do you judge them now? Well, I think I said last time we were together, um, I, um, I resigned at that time in the hope of uh, sending a message uh, uh, that I thought the constant criticism of the courts saying they're soft on crime, they're activists, they're liberal, they're thwarting the will of the majority, was being repeated so often that it was demeaning the judiciary in the eyes of the public and that that was um, unfortunate. And I thought uh, some uh, gallant move in resigning might make a difference. And I, I think I said to you last time I was here, maybe 10 years ago, that it was a total fizzle, uh, that I didn't change anybody's mind. If anything, I think it encouraged it because they said, oh, well, we got rid of Sarek, and maybe if we do this, we can get rid of some other ones we don't like as well. So uh, my intent on uh, uh, making this uh, dramatic move, I think, was a fizzle. And 
I, I think it also indicated that uh, part of it, I think, is thinking uh, you're more important than you really are. Uh, a sign of, uh, of an ego that you think you can make a difference by making some kind of a dramatic move. And, and it, it had no effect at all. Had no effect because if you look at the public and the judiciary today, you see the same relationship. Yes, uh, there's, uh, I mean, the Republicans now are already talking about opposing uh, the next nominee to the Supreme Court, and they don't even know who it is. And I say to myself, well, why? Why, why can't you at least wait and see if there's some valid reason to oppose the nominee? But everybody is so ready uh, to attack, and I think that's the mode that we're in now. We're in the attack mode in the uh, political world, and I was hoping with President Obama that it would at least relax a little bit, minimize, but I'm not so sure that it has. Well, I, I hear among these, the, many of the items in the blogs that I uh, uh, Marked off. Now, let me see if I can find this one. Uh, it had to do with the Chief Justice of the oh, United yes. States. Uh, ah, yes, here it is. Uh, you titled it Unelected Politically Unaccountable Judges. And that's the accusation that's frequently made. Well, they've created an aristocracy of themselves, an elite. They're not responsible to anyone. Uh, but you, you say here, but rather wish to focus. I have no intention of discussing the merits of a uh, particular case, but rather wish to focus on the disappointing use of the phrase, quote, unelected politically unaccountable judges, end quote, by the chief justice in his dissent criticizing the majority opinion. Now, how do you read the chief justice using well, those words. As I said, uh, that language appeared in his dissent uh, when uh, habeas corpus rights were granted to the uh, detainees in Guantanamo. And he used that very expression, saying, you know, he, here are these uh, unelected, unaccountable judges, in effect, uh, uh, acting as they should not act. And uh, I've I said uh, that that is code, has always been code, that the Republicans have used for liberal judges, uh, plus the fact that all judges, I mean, every decision is done by an, un, I mean, at least in the judges. federal courts, by an unelected, uh, politically unaccountable judge, and that's what the Constitution envisioned. And I was a little upset to see him use that language, first of all, because, as I say, it comes right out of the Republican conservative playbook. Uh, but I don't think it would be appropriate or was appropriate for the Chief Justice of the United States to use that very language in criticizing the majority of the court. Are you happy that, pleased that our Constitution provided for judges who would be unelected? Oh, I, absolutely. I, I, I'm very, and I've always been opposed and sort of appalled by elected judges. Ah, this is the subject that I really want to bring us yes. to. Yes. Um, first of all, people voting for judges have no idea as to their qualifications. Uh, I, I dare say they don't even know what the appropriate qualifications for a judge would be, no less whether the judge has it or not. The campaigns, the idea that lawyers and litigants give money to judges before, before whom they appear, I think is an outrage. Uh, the perception is terrible. Um, and uh, some judges who run for re-election run on the basis that, uh, oh, they've never overturned uh, a death penalty, uh, you know, as though that somehow uh, is a, a qualification uh, for being reelected. Uh, I don't think that judges should uh, judges' election should be popularity contests. I mean, as, as I think I said in the article, an unpopular judge can be the very best judge. We don't always make popular decisions, and so I don't think, and I don't mean to demean the citizens who vote, but I don't think they're qualified 
uh, to decide who should be a judge. So appointment should be the only. Absolutely. And there can be, you know, they've tried a lot of experiments with having committees make recommendations to the appointing authority, uh, nonpartisan committees, members of uh, citizens and members of the bar. Uh, but, uh, uh, and I think the people who make the appointments take the uh, responsibility uh, very strongly and uh, want to make sure that they appoint somebody that they'll be proud of. I mean, I don't deny that there's politics uh, in the appointment. I mean, the party picks their own people, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're unqualified. And your further concern, as I understand it from what you've written, is the role that money does play. Yes, I mean, uh, the idea that, uh, and I think there was an article in the New York Times about it, uh, some professor had done a study that people who gave money to the judges fared better than people who didn't. But I don't even think you need that. I think the idea that somebody, uh, either a lawyer or a litigant, can appear before a judge having given money to that judge for a campaign, and the example that I give in the blog is in the middle of a trial, if somebody walked up and handed a check to the judge and said, here's for your campaign, we'd all be outraged. Well, what difference does it make if the check was given a week before? And uh, so I'm, I'm totally opposed to uh, elected judges, but I think close to 40 states have uh, elections for judges. And is it moving in one direction or another? I don't think it's changing. I think, you know, it's one of those things that is sort of ingrained, and I don't think there's any groundswell, despite my views on it, uh, that it's going to change. Understood, but there are many more of these blogs that I want to question you about. Okay. We've reached the end of our program. Stay where you are, and we'll do a second right. program. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Judge Sarakin. Pleasure. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. Meanwhile, as an old friend, another old friend, I should say, used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit the Open Mind website at theopenmind.com. TV. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.